Well, uh, as you know, we're in the, the fourth and final uh, interjection of exhortation in the book of Hebrews, which runs from 1026 down through 1319. Chapter 11, he presents the positive, positive example of faithful people in history. Then in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he urges the hearers in light of this cloud of predecessors whose faith testifies to the church that God's promises are to be trusted. He urges them in light of that cloud of predecessors to run with endurance the race set before them. And he says that involves laying aside every weight, the entanglements of sin, and focusing on Jesus Christ, looking to him. And then in chapter 12, verse 3, he restates the need to focus on Jesus, who endured the ultimate abuse from sinners. Here they are, faithful people being challenged, being pressed, tempted to turn. They're enduring difficulties from non-Christians, from the world. And you look at what Jesus endured from the world, what Jesus endured from sinners, and you look to him and you take strength and courage from that. Chapter 12, verses 4 through 11, he reminds them that unlike Jesus, they had not yet shed their blood in their struggle against sin, in their struggle to remain faithful against these pressures that come on us in, in living here. They hadn't died yet. Jesus had. So look to Jesus who endured the greater for your strength to endure the lesser. And so that's what, he, that's what he's telling them there. And then he also tells them that they need to see their present suffering in a different light. Rather than seeing the mistreatment they were enduring because of their faith as an indication of God's his inattention or his absence, they needed to look at that what was going on and the struggles they were facing to see that as God's loving discipline, which is a sign that they're truly his children. And see, that then converts that into more reason to hold firmly to the gospel, to the truth of Jesus Christ, and rather than to waver, because it's a sign of God's care for you. Okay, so he tells them that in 12, uh, 4 through 11. And in 12, verses 12 through 13, he calls them to rededicate themselves to living the Christian life with all that that entails, to strengthen themselves. And we need to hear this call when we're tempted, when we're tempted to waver and to go, to be called to strengthen yourselves, okay? And that's what he tells them to do in 12, 12, and 13. Then in 12, 14 to 17, he urges the community to take care that none of them turns from the faith so as to miss the grace of God, a communal responsibility. And I talked about that at length last week, that we, that we are to... Take care that none of us turn from the faith. Now, it's ultimately our responsibility, but the community has a responsibility. And he tells them to take care that nobody turns from the faith so as to miss the grace of God. And then he reinforces that appeal by referring to Deuteronomy 29, verse 18, and to the story of Esau from Genesis 25 and 27. Then in 18, verses 18 to 24 of chapter 12, he makes the point that Though turning from God, it's always something that's inexcusable and tragic. He doesn't say that, but that's implied. It's always inexcusable and tragic. It's even more so in light of the glory of the new covenant. It's never uh, something that's, that's uh, a wise move to turn from God. But he's sitting here saying, just consider doing it when you look at the glory of the new covenant. See, unlike the, unlike the old covenant, that as symbolized in these events at Sinai that he drew on, unlike the old covenant that emphasized God's distance, his fearsomeness, the sternness of his commands, you see, all of which had a teaching function, but unlike that covenant, they have come to a covenant portrayed by images of nearness and warmth and openness and celebration. So he says, look, it's always wrong and tragic to turn from God, but to turn from God in the light of the glory of the new covenant's crazy. See, and here he has people who are being tempted, so he's just pounding on this to say, hold, hold, be strong, strengthen. It's insane. There's only one way, only one Lord. Hold, be strong. And this is what we have to tell people. We have to tell one another this. Okay, in chapter 12, verse 25 through 29, I want to pick back up there. And I'll repeat just a bit of what I said, and then I'll go on. It says, see to it that you do not refuse the one who's speaking. For if those who refuse the one who warned them on earth did not escape, how much less will we who turn away from the one who warns from the heavens, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he is promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. 
Now the phrase yet once more makes clear the removal of the things that are shaken as of things that have been made so that the things that are not shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us have gratitude with which let us worship God in an acceptable way with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire." In light of all that he's been saying, the writer, he he warns them not to turn from the Christian faith, not to turn from the truth of Jesus Christ. As I mentioned last week, uh, Guthrie, he expresses the point this way. He says, if those of the old covenant did not escape the wrath of God when they turned from his word, the judgment on those who reject the message of salvation received in the new covenant era is even more certain. And he refers to chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So here we have the people tempted, thinking about turning, all this pressure I didn't know was going to involve all this, and he says, don't do it. You see, don't do it. And then he tells him that the one whose voice shook the earth at Sinai, that he has promised in the future, okay, the one whose voice shook the earth at Sinai has promised in the future to shake out from all creation whatever is not destined for eternity, whatever is inconsistent with that perfect eternal state. Now, this in my mind is the Hebrew writer's way of describing the redemption or the heavenization of creation that will occur at the end. He's speaking of the making of the new heavens and the new earth, referred to in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, Isaiah 66, verse 22, 2 Peter 3, verse 13, and Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. I want to say quite a bit about this, okay? First, I want to read to you a a commentator, Philip Edgecombe Hughes, who expresses what I think he's saying here, the Hebrew writer saying. And then I want to elaborate on this because I think it is important. I think we have given people the idea that the ultimate end game of God is some kind of non-corporeal spiritual existence, and I think that's wrong, and I think it has consequences, okay? The end game is... Resurrection life in a redeemed creation, okay? And that's one of the things I appreciated about uh, Larry West. And uh, when he was preaching, one of the things that he hit on when he had a whole lesson on, are we ghosts? He hit that theme, and that's not something that we commonly talk about, but it's important. And I talked to him about it afterward, and he said he'd had people sit here and jump on him about it. Okay, well, I'm telling you, it's biblical, and it has, it has a great deal, there's, there's more to it than meets the eye, but I want, I want to talk a little bit about that. But let me read to you what this is. This is a long uh, quote here. This is four slides, which I know is a bit tedious, but I wanted to see this because this guy captures what I think. This is Philip Edgecombe Hughes in his commentary written maybe 20 years ago. He says, Then at Mount Sinai, the voice of God shook the earth in such a way that the whole mountain quaked greatly. This awesome moment when God communicated his law before which our fallen and disobedient world stood condemned portended the much greater terror of the last judgment when in the words borrowed from Haggai chapter 2 verse 6, God will shake not only the earth but also the heaven. That is to say the whole created order as in Genesis 1-1 where heaven and earth stand for the totality of creation. But terrifying though such a prospect is, It is also good news for those who are God's faithful people. For the final shaking, which is the completion of judgment, is also the completion of salvation. Our author adds the explanation that the expression yet once more points clearly to the removal of what is shaken and therefore of what is shakable and as such unreliable and impermanent by which the created order in its fallenness is intended as of what has been made. This accords well with the passage from Psalm 102 cited earlier in the epistle, chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, which declares that earth and heaven, the work of God's hands, will perish, that is, as they are presently known to us, and will be changed, whereas God remains eternally the same, Hebrews 13, 8. The purpose of this ultimate shaking is in order that what cannot be shaken may remain. For the people of God who belong to the order of things which are unshakable, the removal of all that is insecure and imperfect is something to be eagerly anticipated. For this final shaking of both heaven and earth is necessary for the purging and eradication from the universe of all that is hostile to God and His will. For the establishment of all that being in harmony with the divine mind is permanent. 
and for the inauguration of the new heaven and the new earth, that is the renewed or changed creation, in which all God's purposes in creation are brought to everlasting fulfillment at the consummation of the redemption procured in and by Christ. Revelation 21, 1, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. And this will take place with the return of Christ in glory and majesty. Thus Gregory of Nazianzus, he was a, a theologian of the 4th century, he explains this last shaking is none other than the second coming of Christ when the universe will be transformed and changed to a condition of stability which cannot be shaken. Okay, this, is, this to me is, you know, to understand the God's end game. Okay, our being in a disembodied existence is the intermediate state. That's not the end game. The end game is resurrection life. Okay, resurrection life. Now, not only will our bodies be transformed to be suitable for eternity, but all of creation is going to be transformed. And you see this in Romans chapter 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 23 is very important. It speaks of what happens to creation. Creation itself is going to be liberated from its bondage to decay. I want to read you a quote from a fellow named Douglas Moo. Moo is a very well-known New Testament scholar. He wrote the commentary on the Book of Romans in the New International Commentary on the New Testament series. Uh, here's something he wrote a few years ago in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society talking about this uh, nature and the new creation. He says, creation, speaking of Romans chapter 8, those verses 18 through 23, creation has been frustrated and is in bondage to decay. That's right from Romans. What can be affirmed on the basis of Romans 8 is that the natural world itself has been affected in some way by the human fall into sin and is therefore no longer in its pristine created state. Human sin has affected the state of nature itself and will continue to do so until the end of this age. If creation has suffered the consequences of human sin... It will also enjoy the fruits of human deliverance. When believers are glorified, creation's bondage to decay will be ended and it will participate in the freedom that belongs to the glory for which Christians are destined. Nature, Paul affirms, has a future within the plan of God. It is destined not simply for destruction but for transformation. The reversal of the conditions of the fall includes the created world along with the world of human beings. Indeed, the glory that humans will experience involving as it does the resurrection of the body necessarily requires an appropriate environment for that embodiment. The hope for the liberation of creation that Paul expresses in Romans 8 clearly implies that the destiny of the natural world is not destruction but transformation. It is an analog, a parallel to what happens to us in resurrection. We will be resurrected bodily, but there will be something different about us. We are not going to be the same. We're not going to be subject to death. We are going to be transformed so that we'll be immortal, glorious, not subject to decay. So there is both continuity and discontinuity in the resurrection. We are the person who's come through, but we are a transformed person. We are in some ways different, but there is still a link so that it is still us on the other side. That's how creation is. It will be radically transformed, but it will in some way be able to say that it has been liberate, it has been liberated from its bondage to decay. It will be transformed. Okay, and you see this, I, well, you see it clearly there in Romans, but I also want to read to you uh, uh, from the concept is expressed in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Now, you might know of N.T. Wright. I refer to him on occasion. N.T. Wright is an internationally known uh, uh, theologian. He's a New Testament scholar. He taught New Testament for many years at Oxford. Uh, he writes a lot of stuff. He's written a book last year called Surprised by Hope. Some years before that, he wrote a huge book on the resurrection of the Son of God. But listen to what he says about Revelation 21 and 22. And I do this because people like this, see, they summarize a lot of stuff. And when I find somebody who says something a way I think is well said, I want to give it to you. Okay, I'm not bowing at the altar of some scholar. I'm giving you this because he expresses what I think is true. Okay, so here, this is a, here's what Wright says. We thus arrive at Revelation 21 and 22, the last and perhaps greatest image of new creation of cosmic renewal in the whole Bible. This time the image of that marriage, this time the image is that of marriage. The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. 
We notice right away how drastically different this is from all those would-be Christian scenarios in which the end of the story is the Christian going off to heaven as a soul, naked and unadorned, to meet its maker in fear and trembling. As in Philippians chapter 3, it is not we who go to heaven, it is heaven that comes to earth. This is the ultimate rejection of all types of Gnosticism, of every worldview that sees the final goal as the separation of the world from God, of the physical from the spiritual, of earth from heaven. It is the final answer to the Lord's prayer that God's kingdom will come and His will be done on earth as in heaven. It is the final accomplishment of God's great design to defeat and abolish death forever, which can only mean the rescue of creation from its present plight of decay. Satan is not going to win and have creation scrapped. God is victorious and creation will be redeemed. Now this has implications, okay? This has implications for the meaningfulness of our labor here and now. If creation is coming through Okay, if it is coming through, albeit transformed, but if this creation is coming through to eternity, then it gives new possibilities for the meaningfulness of our labor. If our labor here, if this creation is going to be scrapped, discarded, and start over with something different, well then, we have less potential for our labor here to matter in the long run. Okay, let me read you something. Again, this is from Wright. I told you, Wright's book, Surprised by Hope, came out last year. Recently, he was interviewed about this book by another New Testament scholar, a guy named Ben Witherington, written a number of commentaries, commentaries on Acts, Galatians, a number of other things. But he says something here that just struck me. It was just intriguing to me. And I want to share it with you just so you can do with it what you want, okay? But he's talking about, Wright argues in that book, Surprised by Hope, based on all this, which is basically standard Christian teaching about a redeemed creation, But Wright takes it and he says, listen, this idea I'm telling you that it opens new avenues for the meaningfulness of our labor in the here and now. So uh, Witherington is questioning him about that. And he says, here's the question. He says, help us connect the dots between our future hope in kingdom come, our present work. Is it a mere foreshadowing of kingdom come or an actual foretaste and so part of that work? Does what we do now get perfected when Jesus and the kingdom come in full? What does it mean to be co-laborers with Christ? And why should that give us hope in the present as well as for the future? Okay, and here's Wright's answer that I just think there's some stuff in here that, uh, like I said, it intrigues me. It interests me greatly. He says, we are not building the kingdom by our own efforts, no. The kingdom remains God's gift, new creation, sheer grace, But as part of that grace already poured out in Jesus Christ and by the Spirit, we are building for the kingdom. I use the image of the 11th century stonemason, probably illiterate, working away on one or two blocks of stone according to the orders given to him. He isn't building the cathedral, he's building for the cathedral. When the master mason architect gathers up all the small pieces of stone at which people have been working away, he will put them into the great edifice which he's had in mind all along and which he alone can build, but for which we can and must build in the present time. Note 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the temple building picture and the way it relates directly to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. What you do in the Lord is not in vain because of the resurrection. Wright goes on, he says, I have absolutely no idea how it might be that a great symphony or painting or the small act of love and gentleness shown to an elderly patient dying in a hospital or Wilberforce campaigning to end the slave trade or the sudden generosity which makes a street beggar happy all day, how any or all of these find a place in God's eventual kingdom. He's the architect, not me. He has given us instructions on the little bits of stone we are meant to be carving. How he puts them together is his business. You see, I like that. You see, I like there's something about that adds a new dimension of meaning to all the little acts we do. Now, we understand you bring somebody to Christ. We understand that. But see, to me, there's something about the ongoing state the transformed reality. And we miss that when we go the ghost route. And if if, if I thought the Bible taught the ghost route, I'd be in the ghost route. But it seems clear to me that there's more to it that God's creation will be redeemed. 
just as we will be. Well, he says in verses 27 and 28, or 28 and 29, this text that we just had up here, he says, since they, and of course we, are receiving an unshakable kingdom, an eternal dwelling of a heavenized creation. Okay, this idea, this notion that this creation gets this ultimate makeover in the sense that it's heavenized. All that is contrary to the eternal purposes of God are stripped out. So that here we have this perfect, the divine utopia, okay, Eden squared. We have this perfect place, this perfect dwelling. And since we are, have this unshakable kingdom, this eternal dwelling of a heavenized creation, they're to be grateful and with a heart of gratitude, they're to worship God in an acceptable way, meaning with reverence and awe. That's how we worship God. You know, we're not flippant about it. We worship God with reverence and awe. We understand who he is and what he's done and what he's promised for us. You know, again, this idea of, you know, bopping in, none of that. There is reverence and awe as we worship God. And those who turn from him in ingratitude, like Esau, who, who spurned their inheritance, they need to know that our God is a consuming fire. Right? This is what he says here, with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. If you want to go Esau's route, and you want to sell out your inheritance for something way less valuable, well then you need to know this. God is a consuming fire. He's not to be trifled with. He is God. And so we have to tell people that. You know, and I just can't tell you how many people, when you tell them stuff like this, that's just negative. I say, well, that's true. <laughs> You know, I, I'm trying to help you. It's the truth. You see, I'm not going to help you by denying that. You have to hear this and you have to understand it. And that's something that uh, we have to get across. All right, chapter 13. So the last chapter, you see. We're, we're closing in on it. Chapter 13 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect hospitality, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as having been imprisoned with them. And the ones being mistreated as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor by all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. The way of life is to be free from love of money, being content with the things you have, for he himself has said, I will in no way leave you, neither will I in any way forsake you. So being confident, we say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Okay, so here he's talking about, he has a number of things here to tell them. He urges them to continue loving fellow Christians. Okay, and then he commands, then he commands two specific expressions of that love. One is that they're not to neglect hospitality, and the other is that they are to remember prisoners. Okay, love everybody. Be loving but then he gives them those two specifics, not to neglect hospitality and to remember the prison. Now, see, the command not to neglect hospitality, it's probably focused on traveling Christian workers. You see that in 3 John verses 5 through 8 as an example. You see, there's a, there's a tendency to shrink from hosting Christian workers when the culture or the society is hostile to Christianity because hosting those workers raises one's public identification with the faith. You see? Now, he doesn't go into all this, but I think this is what's motivating why he's giving them these things. Because you see, you want to kind of hunker down and keep that low profile and be an invisible kind of Christian. That's part of why they're neglecting the assembly. When the culture is looking at you, oh, you're one of them? You're one of them? Well, okay, well, you have this tendency. Here comes some Christian. Well, yeah, you know, somebody else keep him because I really don't want my neighbors and everybody seeing that I'm hosting this Christian dude. Okay, so you can see how that, that temptation would work out. The temptation is to want to keep, keep your head down so as not to attract attention. And, and the statement that by showing hospitality, where he says by showing hospitality some have, have entertained angels, it's probably a reference to Old Testament examples of people who entertained angels unwittingly. You have Abraham and Sarah, Lot, Gideon. You have these examples. Okay, so he's using that to tell them, listen, you need to go ahead and be hospitable. And I think he means specifically with regard to visiting Christian preachers. You cannot use your fear and just say, I'm not going to do my Christian duty because that will raise my profile and I don't want that. Okay, we're not to do that. And then he says, you know, there's also a tendency, 
just as there is to want to keep a low profile and not host Christian preachers, there's also a tendency to shrink from, uh, to forget about our fellow believers in prison for the same reason. Okay, we've got Christians who are thrown in jail for whatever reason, whether it be a trumped up charge or whether it be just basically for their faith. Well, who wants to go and hang with them and take care of them and then have everybody see, so, oh, you're with them too. Okay, well, when I go in here and I'm helping this guy who's in all, he's already in prison. Well, I kind of like say, well, you know, uh, somebody else go help that dude. You see, but I think that's why he's raising it. The writer tells them that they're to remember those in prison as if they were right with them. You see, having them always before their eyes so that you can't get away from them. Right here. Remember them just like you're right there with them. So you can't blow them off and sit here and forget about them. Remember what they're going through. And then he even goes on and he, t- he says that they're to remember those being beaten as if their own bodies were receiving the blows. That's what this is when he, when he sits here and says, and the ones being mistreated as being yourselves also in the body. You are to have that kind of identification with them that when they're beaten, it's as though they're beating you. Now that tells you something again about the bonds of Christian faith and Christian brotherhood that I think we need to work on. You see, this is something that is alien in our culture, this idea of of family, brothers, obligations. I've used before, uh, you know, I think it was Brother John, wasn't it Buddy who called you in the middle of the night? There's John, my brother back there. We haven't had another brother who died some years ago, but uh, uh, at one point he, w- he called John in the middle of the night. He was broken down somewhere on some bridge at like 2 or 3 in the morning. He called my brother and said, come get me. All right, well, when my brother got up, I went and got him. Now, why did he do that? Because it's his brother. <laughs> you see, why did he do it? He said, because it's his brother. Why did my brother call him? Because it's his brother. <laughs> you see, and that's just there's something about brotherhood and fellowship that they took and they and that's what helped change the world because they said who are these people who care for people who aren't their literal family but they treat them like they are they pay for their burials they take care of the widows they do all this stuff and then he says in verse 4 that marriage is to be honored by all okay now if there's ever a message that I think a culture and a society and a church needed to hear, it is that marriage is to be honored by all. See, it's a God-given institution that is to be considered precious and valuable by the Christian. Okay? That is, here it's a flat out. Marriage is to be honored by all. We're to consider it precious and valuable. If without being married, you relate to another person in a way that is reserved for marriage creating your own immoral arrangement, you're saying, in essence, that marriage is misconceived, that it's a burden rather than a blessing, and you've designed a superior structure for male-female relationships. Here is marriage that God has given to you. And you say, no, i got a better idea. I think my girlfriend and I or my boyfriend, we're going to sleep together as though we're married and not get married because marriage is a bummer. Now tell me that's not true in our culture. That is true in our culture. And we are dishonoring, not to mention that we got people saying, no, we ought to have marriage now between people of the same sex. Okay, do I have to say that's crazy? That's dishonoring marriage? Okay, it is dishonoring marriage. Because marriage is clearly a man and a woman. Okay, but there are other things about this. We got, look, we have people who say, well, okay, I'm married, yes, yes, you know, and and then be married for a while, and then just give their spouse the boot. And what is our reaction as a church? We are so afraid, when that happens, of saying, listen, that was wrong for you to do that. Yeah, but, you know, uh, he's not perfect. You know, okay, that's not the question. The question is, he's still committed to the marriage, she's still committed to the marriage, and what you're saying is, get out. And the church is so timid. Instead of saying, that was wrong. I read denominational people. Denominational people, I read them who talk about that kind of circumstance and assume that people would be disfellowshipped for that. I don't see it in the church. I see people treat people like that in blatant disregard and violation of Christ's call on their life. And we just sit there and say, well, you know, marriage is a tough thing. 
It's really, it is a tough thing. But it's still wrong to simply give your spouse the boot and just say, get out, I'm tired, I don't love you anymore. No, you say, I'm a Christian, we're committed, we're going to work, I'll never leave you. Ever going to leave you. Right? Is that the truth? Am I telling you the truth? I'm telling you. Okay, and this is the thing, we're just so timid about it, and if we don't get some spine about this and wind up being able to tell people, no, that was wrong. Oh, but yeah, okay, I understand, nobody's perfect, but that was wrong. He, she's willing to work on the marriage. You need to do that. And the church needs to come to its, its members and say that to them. Okay, isn't that how it's designed? I think that's right. So this thing about honoring marriage is very important. Our society needs to hear it. We need to hear it, and we need to take it seriously. We need to take this seriously. Then he also says, he says that in verse 4, that the marriage bed which is a euphemism for sexual relationship. The marriage bed is to be undefiled, which is the next clause makes clear, means there's to be no sexual involvement of any kind with anyone other than your husband or wife. Okay? No sexual, you know, this is the ultimate in betrayal. That is why it serves as an image of, you know, when you're unfaithful to God. You say, why is that? Because there's no greater betrayal in a human relationship than you to say to your wife, I love you, I'm going to spend my life with you, and then go sneak out on her and have sexual relations with someone else. It's an abomination. Absolutely. Okay? No defense for it. And so he sits here and says, look, you're, you're, the marriage bed is to be honored. Now, you may get away with it with your friends. You may get away with it with people in church. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows if you're tiptoeing around and doing this kind of stuff and betraying your spouse. And what is he saying here? I mean, he says, look, you know, there's to be none of that. You can conceal it, but God will judge you for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So if, if you're involved in that, my word to you is you need to repent. You need to repent. Okay, that's just it. Now, I'm telling you that because if you do not if you do not repent, if you continue to do this in defiance of God, you will be lost. Okay? I mean, that's clear. If you repent, there's mercy. And hopefully from your spouse. Okay? But you need to stop that. This is, this is serious stuff, and we have gotten so saturated sexually as a culture. We just yawn at this stuff. Everything. We just, you know, if it's got to do with sex, well, you know, it's just the way life is. And it's just shameful. And it's shameful when it comes into the church. It just can't be. Okay? It simply cannot be. All right. The writer, he, he, he may have included this admonition about these sexual sins. This may just be a general kind of thing and a general reminder. In other words, it could just be, you know, like a parallel uh, what was being said about, you know, a general thing, you know, what Bill was talking about with the hospitality, this could just be a general kind of thing, a general reminder of this need. It's always timely, but it's possible it's more closely tied to the situation of the hearers. He doesn't say this, but you could see how this would be particularly important. Coaster, he says, those who show hospitality bring strangers into their homes, making it important to observe rigorous standards of propriety imprisonment of a spouse left the other spouse without marital companionship for an indefinite period economic difficulties sometimes led to the exchange of sexual favors in return for benefits so you can say well maybe he has in the back of his mind in making this generally applicable statement about honoring the you know ma honoring marriage and the marriage bed being undefiled but also maybe it's triggered something by his understanding of the circumstance and situation that when you're in a difficult environment, if your husband or wife gets tossed in the can, particularly your husband in that culture, leaves the wife in a, quite a tight. 
Okay, of course, that is when the church, brothers and sisters, would fill that. You see, and come and help that person who was in that situation. But maybe some of it's geared toward that. He tells them in verses 5 and 6 that the proper way to live is to be free from the love of money, being content with one's present possessions. Another thing, does our society need to hear this? Does the church need to hear this? You see, we do indeed. I mean, a Jew who is being ostracized by the Jewish community for his or her faith, which is what I think is at least partly lurking behind this letter, the Jewish community, you have these people are being tempted to turn back to Judaism. Part of the, at least as I've reconstructed it, part of the pressure is they're being ostracized by the Jewish community. Now, what would that mean? That would mean less economic opportunities for you. You know, your family members and all this, cousin so-and-so and this person over here, he's not going to employ you anymore. And I know you couldn't remember this, but the, I, I read at the very first class a kind of a, a hypothetical of the circumstance that would lead to the writing of this letter. And you had that person who was losing his job and, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't keep a decent job. And it's because everybody had turned against him and nobody would help him out. Now, if you had that type of situation, you'd have people who were tempted, you see, to, to care so much about money, tempted to turn away from Christ to expand their economic possibilities. I have to do this so I can earn a decent living. I have to deny Christ for economic reasons. This is killing me. And so, you know, I think that you see here at least, uh, you know, reading into this. You know, I hope not too much, but this idea, I think there's something about that that, you know, listen, you can't do that. You're not to be, you're not to put money above Christ. If it ever comes to you dishonoring Jesus Christ for money, well, they got a word for that kind of thing in a human context. You don't do it. Okay? You just trust that he's going to take care of you. You stay with him. You live for him. You do what is right. And you let him take care of the situation. See, when the temptation strikes, they need to hold firm, remembering the faithfulness as exemplified in the statement to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, that he would never leave or forsake him. Thank you for coming. I heard that bell.